We are beginning a new series, Hello, My Name is Jesus, and we are going to be looking at eight lesser-known characters in the Bible uh, and see from how we can learn from them uh, as to who Jesus is and how, how, what Jesus means to us. And today, it's going to be a woman uh, named Tamar, and it is her story. How many of you have ever heard of Tamar before? Okay, quite a few of you. Good. Um, I don't know if you took the opportunity to read Genesis chapter 38 before the service. Um, we're going to look at a portion of that chapter. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. Um, just by way of uh, reminder, uh, this is the first Sunday of the month, so this is uh, one of our teaching services. And on the back side you have of the bulletin, you have some scriptures to reflect on. And in our teaching, teaching services, we will also highlight one part of our church confessions. And today, the confession at the bottom of that list is Heidelberg Catechism, Question and Answer 2. And the question that is being asked is, what must you know to live and die in the joy of this comfort? That is the comfort we have in Jesus. And the answer is three things. First, how great my sin and misery are. Second, how I am set free from all my sins and misery. And third, how I am to thank God for such deliverance. We're going to look at this idea of our, our sin and misery through the lens, through the story of Tamar. So let me give you just a bit of a background to the story of Tamar. Um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. One of those 12 sons was Judah. And in uh, Genesis chapter 38, we have a story about Judah and Tamar. Judah left home and went to live among the Canaanites instead of staying among his own tribe. And there he married a Canaanite. And that was not something that was uh, welcomed among Abraham and his family. So it was sort of an act of defiance. And he married a Canaanite and he had three children, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. Now, um, Ur being the firstborn would be the heir of the estate, would be the, the man of the house who would inherit the majority of the property. And so it was very important that Ur had a wife so that they could have a son and continue the family line. So he arranges for Ur to uh, marry another Canaanite girl named Tamar. Now Ur was not a good man, and uh, eventually his sin caught up to him and he dies. And Tamar is left childless. In the custom of the day, um, women were essentially the property of the men and the household. And what the most important thing for women was that they had sons. In, the, in having a son, that was their hope because the son would inherit some of the property and they would get their provision and care through their son. So it was important that Ur uh, have a son and that Tamar have a son. So the custom of the day was Tamar was then to marry Ur's brother. It's called the Leveret marriage. And just think of that in your own context. If you have daughters or if you are a daughter and your husband dies and you've got to marry your, husband's, your dead husband's brother. Uh, okay, very different culture and time, but that's how it was set up because the most important thing for the family was that a son be produced. And for Tamar, too, she desperately needed a son. So Judah arranges for uh, Onan, Ur's brother, to marry Tamar. Onan wants nothing to do with it. He does not want to produce a son for Ur because then that means the inheritance goes to Ur's family, whereas he wants to be the firstborn. So he refuses to have a child with Tamar, and he ends up dying as a result too. Now Judah's kind of worried because now two of his sons have died, and he's got one more son, and he does not want to lose that son, and this Tamar seems to be under a curse. So he says to Tamar, you know what, you go away, go back to your father's house and uh, I'll call you later when Sheila is old enough to get married, and then I'll take care of you. But he had no intention of marrying off Tamar to his son. And so Tamar is now sort of rejected as property in Judah's household and sent back to her own family as spoiled goods, never going to be married now because she's used. 
I'm um, talking in l lousy property language, but that was essentially how it was. And there she is. No future, no hope um, for a future, for a child. That's where we're picking up the story. Uh, verse 12 of uh, Genesis 38. After a long time, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. When Judah had recovered from his grief, he went up to Timnah, to the men who were shearing his sheep. And his friend Hira, the Adulamite, went with him. When Tamar was told, your father-in-law is on his way to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's clothes, covered herself with a veil to disguise herself, and then sat down at the entrance to an aim, uh, which is on the road to Timnah. For she, th for she saw that, though Sheila, uh, Judah's son, had now grown up, she had not been given to him as his wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she, was, for she had covered her face. Not realizing that she was his daughter-in-law, he went over to her by the roadside and said, Come now, let me sleep with you. And what will you give me to sleep with you, she asked. I'll send you a young goat from my flock, he said. Will you give me something as a pledge until you send it? She just wants to make sure. Uh, he said, yes, uh, what pledge shall I give you? Your seal and its cord. That's the family seal that signified his authority in the household. And your staff, the staff in your hand, she answered. So he gave them to her and slept with her, and she became pregnant by him. After she left, she took off her veil and put on her widow's clothes again. Meanwhile, Judah sent the young goat by his friend, the Adulamite, in order to get his pledge back from the woman, but he did not find her. He asked the men who lived there, where is the shrine prostitute who was beside the road at a name? There hasn't been a shrine prostitute here, they said. So he went back to Judah and said, I didn't find her. Besides, the men who lived there said there hasn't been any shrine prostitute here. So Judah said, let her keep what she has or we're going to become a laughing stock. After all, I did send her the payment of the young goat, but you didn't find her. After about three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law, Tamar, is guilty of prostitution, and as a result, she is now pregnant. Judah said, bring her out and have her burned to death. As she was being brought out, she sent a message to her father-in-law, I am pregnant by the man who owns these things. And she added, see if you recognize whose seal and cord and staff these are. Judah recognized them and said, she is more righteous than I, since I wouldn't give her to my son Sheila. And he did not sleep with her again. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb, and as she was giving birth, one of them put out his hand, so the midwife took a scarlet thread and tied it on his wrist and said, This one came out first. But when he drew back his hand, his brother came out, and she said, So, this is how you have broken out. And he was named Perez, which means to break out. And then his brother, who had the scarlet thread on his wrist, came out, and he was given the name Zerah, which means scarlet. Hello, my name is Tamar. What a story. What a disturbing story. How do we see Jesus in this story? As, as disciples, we walk through scriptures with Jesus to learn from him and to understand what it means to follow him. And in this story, we experience some very disturbing things. And the first question that comes to my mind is, why is this story even in the Bible? If God inspired Scripture to be put together to communicate a message, why does God include this story in the Bible? And uh, what I want to do, uh, by the way, I don't know if you saw in the bulletin and in the email, I suggested you watch a video by The Bible Project. I highly recommend 
the Bible Project videos. In fact, if you type in Bible Project Genesis, Bible Project any other book of the Bible, you'll get these videos. They're about eight minutes long. Sometimes there's two, but they're not very long. But they give you an overview of the whole passage uh, of the whole book and very helpful for understanding what each story or what each book means. And so I encourage you to look up the Bible Project Genesis. There's two, 1 through 11 and 12 through 50, to get an overview of the book of Genesis. But I'm going to summarize a little bit about what's going on in the book of Genesis to help under and answer the question, why is this book in the Bible? And why is this chapter of the Bible? So first of all, let's break it down in order. Um, there are sections in the book. Uh, really, there are two main sections. Genesis 1 through 11 describes how God creates the world very good and then it becomes cursed by human sin. And so Genesis 1 through 11 starts from the wonder of very good creation and goes down uh, through the flood, Cain and Abel, and ends with the Tower of Babel where the nations are, are fighting and they're scattered throughout the world. And it's just an unpacking of the curse that has, has, has come over God's creation, God's good creation and then the curse. And really, the rest of the Bible sort of shows how that curse is working itself out. In Genesis chapter 3, God promises that the creation He created very good and that He blessed, now under a curse, would be restored through a seed or a child of the woman. Genesis 3.15 speaks about the woman's offspring who will crush the head of the serpent and who will be struck and wounded by that serpent. So we have a wounded Messiah. And this idea of a wounded Messiah or a wounded victor sort of runs throughout Scripture. And, and so important because that's how is God going to bring about this wounded Messiah into the world? Well, the second half of the book is where God narrows down the story to the family of Abraham. And because we know the story of the Bible, we know that it's through the family of Abraham that this wounded Messiah comes. So Genesis 12 through 50 is the section about Abraham, and it starts with God's promise, I am going to bless you, and through you, all the nations of the world are going to be blessed. So God is restoring the original creation blessing through the family of Abraham, and as we will see, that promise comes through the family of Judah. We can break down that family of Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob had 12 sons, and those 12 sons become the 12 tribes of Israel. Exodus talks about how those 12 tribes become a nation, and then the rest of the Bible, Old Testament, is about the nation of Israel. But um, the end of the book of Genesis, verses chapters 37 through 50, zero in even more on the man Joseph. 37 through 50 is all about Joseph. And we know, I, I trust you know the story of Joseph. He was the one son who um, uh, his brothers didn't like and Judah, um, sorry, Jacob loved. He gets sent to Egypt as a slave and, and eventually uh, he becomes the ruler in Egypt and his brothers come, come desperately for help. He feeds them and that's how the nation of Israel ends up in Egypt. That's how the book pretty much ends, except for chapter 49, where Jacob blesses his 12 sons. And that blessing is so important because he blesses each son individually, but one son in particular gets a special blessing. And you would think, because Joseph is the good guy in all these chapters, that it's Joseph that gets the special blessing. When in fact we hear a different assurance. We hear that it is Judah, not Joseph, who is going to get the ultimate blessing. You're going to have to look that up. I didn't write that verse down. Um, oh, here it is. I got it right here. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. This is Genesis 49, verse 10. Until he comes to whom it belongs and the obedience of the nations is his. Who is the one to whom the authority belongs? Well, that's that wounded Messiah from Genesis chapter 3 that the people are waiting for, that hero who would break the curse. 
Judah is going to be the father of the Messiah. And if you know the rest of the history, Judah, Bethlehem, um, David, son of David, uh, Jesus is born from the line of Judah. This is also important, and the Jews would have understood this perfectly because that's how they understood their story. Remember, the Jews, Jews are basically a short form of the people of Judah and uh, they, their understanding of the Messiah coming through them. So when they read the book of Genesis, they knew that this was the storyline going through it. But then why on earth didn't God choose Joseph, the good guy? And then you insert this chapter out of the flow, the regular flow of Joseph, and you put this bizarre chapter of Judah, who runs away from home and marries a Canaanite. He has sons who are, 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 are wicked and who end up dying in their sin, and he has a daughter-in-law who prostitutes herself and, and has children through him, and he, of course, is the one that, that produced the child through his daughter-in-law, and it's like, oh, this is sick. And you might even have noticed, I didn't read the whole chapter. Read the whole chapter, and, and you'll see. It's just like, well, why is this in the Bible? But there's a very important reason why this is in the Bible. Because from beginning to end, the way God works in the world is not to take the best, not to take the holiest, not to take the, the most faithful, the, the, the righteous, but to take sinners, humble sinners, people that we would look at and say, how did they get in? And he chooses them to show his undeserved mercy. And this story was a reminder to the Jews, and if they knew their own history, they would know, you guys are no better than anyone else. You need to remember that. Next question, sort of tied to this. Why does God put up with such sin and misery? That's a picture of the religious leaders. You might say the Judas bringing out the Tamar to Jesus so that she can be burned to death, right? That, that's what Judah did with Tamar. Let her be burned to death for her sin. Let's not forget that he slept with a shrine prostitute, right? But let's, let's burn this woman for her sin. And that's what the religious leaders do. Let's burn this woman. Let's stone this woman. She sinned. And, and Jesus says, uh, you guys, no sin, okay? I, you think you have no sin? You haven't figured it out. Anyways, why does God put up with this? And, and I'm, sin and misery is really what the story of this world is without God. Just because this story is in the Bible doesn't mean that it shows us the way things ought to be. In fact, it shows us the way things shouldn't be. Genesis 3 verse uh, 16 describes the result of the curse. And the curse is what happened to our world because Adam and Eve rebelled against God. Enmity with the serpent, verse 15. But in verse 16, it talks about the division between Adam and Eve. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. And some people say, well, see, that's where God introduces headship, where the man is responsible for the woman. No, no, no. No, this is the curse. This is not the way God designed it. This is God's announcement of what has just happened in our world is instead of harmony, you now have battle between the sexes, oppression and abuse and neglect and violence. The exact same words from Genesis 3.16 are repeated in Genesis chapter 4, speaking to Cain and Abel, and in particular Cain when he's battling with sin. Sin is crouching at your door it desires to have you. Well, what kind of desire does sin have for Cain? Wants to take him over. Wants to take charge of his life. Same word for desire that's used in Genesis 3. Your desire will be for your husband. Take over, have him. And he will rule over you. You must rule over your sin. It's not, I'm in charge, I'm the boss. It's like, it's a battle. It's a, it's a pressure. It's a fight. What Genesis 3.16 shows us is the battle of the sexes. 
And what we see in the rest of the Bible is the outworking of that. Lamech is the first man who says, I have seven wives. And, and, you know, polygamy sets in. Was that God's design? No. Practiced in the Old Testament. Is that God's will? No. But that's what happens when those in power take charge and authority over those that they have control over. And then you see the patriarchal society. Women become property. Instead of equal image bearers, Genesis chapter 1, they now become property. And, and they have no strength or, or worth or value in and of themselves apart from having sons. No property or possession. And, and the, the leveret marriage thing is not... Let me explain. Even though it's in the Bible, it's even in the law of Moses, it's not God's will. It's not God's design. God did not design for women to be property passed on from one to the next. Divorce, even though it's in God's law, Jesus says Moses permitted it because of the hardness of your hearts. But that has not been God's will from the beginning. What we see in this story is how our world continues to be stained and cursed by this unhealthy, violent, destructive, harmful relationship between men and women, men and children, women and children. It's like, it's awful. And we need to see this as a part of the curse. The Me Too movement, big in the news, and lots of people coming forward who are saying, I've been abused too. I've been mistreated too. I've been silenced too. And rightly so, when that has happened, that needs to be rejected and condemned as an evidence of the curse. It is the curse and not God's design. And we should be sickened by it any form of abuse. And I know that sometimes some men have been falsely accused. I don't know when or I don't know how often. And I sometimes hear men say, but that's what's dangerous about this. Yeah, no doubt it is. But how many centuries have women been falsely accused and silenced and not given a voice? Centuries. We're talking like a long, long time. And the fact that it's now reversing itself and turning in a different direction, perhaps that's not right, but it needs to be understood in the context. All violence and oppression against anyone needs to be rejected. That is not God's design. And we shouldn't be ashamed to say when we read stories like this, this is wrong. And when we read the newspaper every week, when you read the news, there will be a story of abuse, of violence. I, I heard about um, two Saudi Arabian girls living in Con Hong Kong right now, of course, in Saudi Arabia. The rule of guardianship, they cannot travel without a male's permission. That's not how God designed things to be. And we should rightly acknowledge that as a curse, as a part of the curse. And they now have no home and they can't go anywhere and the government doesn't know what to do with them. Two other Saudi Arabian girls who took their own lives in New York City, they committed suicide rather than face the risk of being sent back home to their homes. Now, it's not just Saudi Arabia. There are many societies that still retain these unhealthy, unhelpful distinctions and, and, and uh, limitations on people in society. And it should, again strike us as this is wrong. This is why I won't even use the words in marriages, who gives this woman to this man? That's part of the property language. That's part of the assumption that a daughter was handed over from her family home to the new husband's home and some kind of bride price was pay exchanged. This is not how God created things to be. And now we ask the question, well, then why does God not step in and do something about it? Why does God allow centuries of abuse and injustice and, and violence? Why doesn't God just stop it? I'm sure there are many people who have asked that question, and I still ask that question. I don't know. 
I have a hint. I have an, a thought. What are God's options? Well, he could ignore it, and some people think that's what he did, or he could punish it. What if God just punished every sin that ever happened so that it wouldn't happen again? But then who would be here? If God punished every sin the way it deserved, what if he just punished the ones that we thought were the really bad ones, but not the ones that we have? Where does God start? Where does God stop? Who should he punish? Who shouldn't he punish? Was Tamar innocent? Was Tamar guilty? Well, she was a part of that whole miserable mess. And God steps into that situation, and as we will see, he does something good. God's third option is to step into the story. To walk with, work with, and become one with people in their misery. And to go to the lowly and lift them up. To identify with the wounded and weary and broken by becoming a wounded Messiah. By taking upon himself all of that abuse and violence and sin and misery upon himself and saying, I am going to overcome it. Not by punishing you. The flood didn't work. It didn't get rid of sin. It just punishes and gets rid of people. And he wants to save people. So he says, I will become one with you in your story. And I will produce hope and life through you. Tamar. Men think you're junk, used, spoiled goods. Men condemn you because you get pregnant, even though they sleep with temple prostitutes. Yes, I know, they reject you, but I want you to know, you're my family. God says, you belong to me. And I choose you, Tamar, to be a part of my family. Which leads to the last question. How does this story teach us about Jesus? I've shown this image before, and I love this image. And it's, a, it's an image of, of a Jesus at a Last Supper table with modern-day people that we might think don't fit the Christian uh, category. I don't know how well you can see it, but they look like thugs and gangsters and, and whatever else. And, and it's jarring, and it, it, it makes you say, well, oh, that's not church. Uh, they, you know, that's not who God works with. In Tamar, we see exactly who God works with and walks with. I included on that sheet uh, a quote from Matthew chapter uh, 1. I'll just read it. We, most of us skip over the genealogy of Jesus because the names are boring, right? Never skip over the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. Why? This is the family history of Jesus Christ. He came from the family of David, and David came from the family of Abraham. Abraham uh, was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah. Their mother was Tamar. Why is Tamar's men name mentioned when they only included women, men's names in the genealogies? Because God's making a point. Not only that, keep reading. You know who else's names you see? Rahab, prostitute in Jericho. Uh, Ruth, the Moabite woman, a foreigner, outsider. And Bathsheba, the woman that David raped, listed in Jesus' family tree. In other words, through Tamar and people like her, God is saying, these are the people I came for. These are the people that I identify with. It is not because you're better than others. And how many other stories of Jesus do we say the same thing played out? John chapter 8, the sinful woman brought to Jesus. Condemn her, burn her, stone her because she's a sinner, caught in sexual sin. And Jesus just points it right back at the Pharisees. And you know what Jesus might have said and could have quoted Genesis 38 to those religious leaders? It's what the punchline of Genesis 38 is, verse 26. When convicted of his guilt for what he did to Tamar, he says, she is more righteous than I. 
that's the lesson. This woman guilty of prostitution is more righteous. And for a Jew to be righteous was the most important thing. And Jesus could have said to those religious leaders who brought that sinful woman, she is more righteous than you. And those people around the table are more righteous than you. And that tax collector who prayed before God and the Pharisee with him, he is more righteous than the Pharisee. Because righteousness is not found in how good we are. But in our brokenness, our sin, and our misery, and our acknowledgement that we need God. God is making a point. And if you don't see that point in the Old Testament, then look at it at the people that Jesus called to be his disciples. Matthew 10, list of disciples, a tax collector, a zealot, the people that the religious leaders spurned and scorned. Twelve people that the religious leaders would not have picked to be Jesus' followers. And Jesus picks twelve people. Do you get the word emphasis? Twelve the 12 sons of Jacob who formed the Old Testament nation of Israel. And Jesus selects 12 oddballs and rejects and sinners to be his disciples to form the new people of God, the new covenant people of God. That's how Tamer shows us. Through her ordinary, extraordinary, sinful, disturbing life, the tragic circumstances how she reveals Jesus, and the same is true for you. If you think that you are less than someone else here, if people treat you as less because of your way of life or the things that you've done, you need to understand you are much closer to the heart of God than the people who think they are more righteous. This story ought to challenge the way we think about people, especially people that we deem sinners and living in sin. And this is a story that challenges the way we think, especially about those who are caught up in the, the grip and the curse and the misery of sexual disorder and sexual sin, because that is such a prominent issue in our world today. And many people are taking that high and holy position of, Look at those sinners. And I wonder whether God's looking at us and saying, he, she is more righteous than you. That's a convicting thought. And we don't know what's going on in their lives, which is why we should not be passing judgment. We have no right to pass judgment. Because God knows our heart. And none of us is more righteous than anyone else. And that is only for God to call. And so we reflect on our sin and misery and realize, I need to come clean before God for my sin and not to judge others for theirs. Because God's family is made up of people that I may not think belong, but really, I belong no more or less than them. Are you surprised that God let you in his family? You should be. And so should I. Because no one can say I'm better than someone else. And everyone stands equal at the foot of the cross of Jesus, where he says, welcome to my family. May we experience the wonder of his amazing grace. And may we respond to it by being gracious as he has been gracious to us. Let us pray. Father God, this has been a heavy and hard and yet wonderful message, a reminder that each one of us, every one of us, not only here in this room but around the world, is no more worthy or less worthy than anyone else. May the message of Tamar and the fact that you have chosen to welcome her in your family remind us of the wonder of your forgiveness and love and your embrace through Jesus. And may each one of us be humbled and lifted up to know that even if our life is a mess, even if we've done things that we're ashamed of, even if people call us sinners, we are close to your heart when we acknowledge our need for you. 
Help us to know your grace better and help us to show your grace better. To that end, let us pray out loud together these words. Lord Jesus, impress on my heart the wonder of your amazing grace to me. Help me to be humble and gracious in how I relate to other sinners like me. Amen.